time we were here, we talked about the first part of Daniel chapter 8, and that was the vision. And we stopped there, and now we're going to pick up the, what part of it's called the audition, the interpretation. The angel explains many things that Daniel had seen. We're going to find out that the uh, angel told Daniel pretty much everything, what the vision was, except one thing. And we'll see that later on. And so let's get with our Bibles, open up to Daniel chapter 8. We're going to begin around verse 20. And before we start, let's have prayer. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you be with us now as we open your word. Give us wisdom, give us understanding. Let us see these things that we ordinarily might not see. Help us to understand. Give us wisdom. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel had, had, had the vision. It ended there in verse 19. And Daniel said, and he said, Behold, I'm going to inform you of what will occur at the final period of indignation, because it pertains to, to the appointed time of the end. Um, the interpretation actually starts back in verse 15, when Daniel says, When I had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. Behold, standing before me was one who looked like a man, and I heard the voice of a man between the banks of the Uli, and he called out and said, Gabriel, explain the vision to this man. Now this first man that he sees, we can uh, infer that this was the pre-incarnate Jesus, is giving the command to the angel Gabriel to explain the vision. Now we see this same being uh, a little bit later on, or earlier that we saw him in there in verse 14, when he's... Uh, was asking the question in 13 about how long or till when and uh, that certain one, that Palmoni, wonderful number, gave the answer in verse 14. So we see him again telling Gabriel to explain to Daniel what the vision was. So Gabriel came near to where I was standing and when he came I was frightened and fell on my face and he said, said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Now this is interesting because many people will see Antiochus Epiphany here in, in this uh, vision. And we're going to show that here in just a little bit. But he says that this vision pertains to the time of the end. And the end of what? Uh, the end of time? Or the time of the end of just what's going on now? This is a, an apocalyptic vision. This is a vision dealing with consummation. This is uh, not something that is we see generally in the Old Testament. In fact, this is the only apocalyptic book in the Old Testament. And uh, it's not until uh, the time of Daniel that we even see it in the 6th century. And uh, so here I, I think it's referring to the time of the end, the end of all things. Daniel 18, uh, uh, 8 verse 18 begins with, now. While he was talking with me, I was dazed with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me to stand at my place. And he said, Behold, I'm going to inform you of what will occur at the final period of the indignation, because it pertains to the appointed time of the end. Again, reference to the end. And this takes us, I believe, down to the consummation, not just to some period of time. And he begins to explain to him in verse 20 what the vision is. Remember the Bible in many ways will explain itself. And the ram that we saw, we don't have to invent who he was. Who did the ram represent? He says right here in verse 20. The ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of, the Media, of Media and Persia. So we know who it is. We don't have to guess. There is no uh, assumption here. The goat, same thing. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. We know that it's Greece who comes against the means of the person. And the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And who's the first king? Alexander the Great. The broken horn and the four horns that came up in his place represent four kingdoms, which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. And that's true. We know that when Greece, when Alexander died, that Greece... I fell apart, and within a few years, a number of years, 
is divided into four kingdoms, but never in its power and its strength or even its geography. It lost some, some territory. And then he goes on and writes in verse 23, And in the later period of their dominion, these four kingdoms, in the later period of their dominion, this takes us some time to get down to it, when the wrongdoers have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue, and his power will be mighty, but not by his own power. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree, and be successful, and do as he pleases. And he will destroy mighty men, and holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will make deceit a success by his influence. And he will make himself great in his own mind. And he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. And the vision of the evenings and the mornings which have been told is true, but as for you, keep the vision secret, because it pertains to many days in the future. And then I, Daniel, was exhausted, sick for days, and I got up and carried on the king's business, but I was astounded at the vision. There was no one to explain. Now the angel had pretty much given him the fine points of what all the symbols were. He had explained the vision as he was commanded except for one thing. He didn't fulfill his commission. He didn't explain time. He had said it best in verse 26, And the vision of the evenings and mornings which has been told is true. And then he's told to keep it secret. We see in chapter 12 that these things are sealed. It's the time elements of Daniel. Not the whole book, but the time elements that have been sealed. And they're opened later on. He's told to keep this secret because it pertains to many days in the future. So Daniel is still confused as to how this ties in. You see, he's a man of his day. He's looking at his own people in exile. The temple is in ruin, his nation is gone, and he's looking for that to be restored, and God's image to be restored, his, his God. I mean, he's, his people are in exile, and this doesn't reflect well on God. And this we will see later on, when we get into chapter 9, uh, in Daniel's long prayer, about uh, how God looks in this whole thing. And not so much that his people deserve to be restored, God is looking weak to the, to the pagan nations. And so, Daniel's focusing more here and instead of this long picture. And so it says he was astounded at the vision and there were no one to explain it. He had no ex explanation of what was going on. Uh, it was a matter of time. He didn't understand time. Maybe... Maybe he's seeing this 2300 and all this stuff. He's thinking that maybe his people are going to be in exile longer. This may have been the impetus to his prayer in his research into uh, Jeremiah, the beginning of chapter 9, why he does this. Because he knows the time is coming up when it should be fulfilled and the people should be restored. But maybe God is going to keep them there longer. Again, he's looking at the micro, not necessarily the macro, the big picture. So here we have this explanation of this power, this little horn power that we see in uh, around verses 8 to 9. Uh, 12, 13, 13 is the question, how long, till when? When is this not going to be uh, taken care of? And uh, when is this going to come to the end, this power, uh, persecuting power of this little horn? And it's on the 2300th evening morning that this temple would be cleansed, or the sanctuary would be cleansed, restored, vindicated. And, uh, but the description of this little horn that the angel gives, in verses 23, 24, and, on, and onward, uh, has been attributed to um, Antiochus Epiphany, Antiochus IV. And so we're going to take a little, bit, a little look at this here. Notice that it says, that uh, in the period of dominion, back 
back in the vision area, Daniel saw the vision. And uh, he saw the little horn. And the male goat made himself perfectly great. In verse 8. But once he became powerful, the large horn was broken and in its place four prominent horns came up towards the four winds of heaven. And this idea of these four horns coming up had been pictured to be coming up out of one of the four horns of the goat. And that usually they had pictured that to be Antiochus coming out of one of the four horns, which was Syria, uh, his domain. The uh, Some of the points that are set here about what makes Antiochus the one designated in chapters 7 and 8. Generally speaking, the little horn of Daniel 7 had been attributed to the last day Antichrist, not to Antiochus IV. It is the little horn of chapter 8 which gets this distinction. John F. Wolver uh, says he's a dispensationalist. There is an obvious distinction, he says, between the little horn which is mentioned here, Daniel 8, 9-12, and the little horn of Daniel 7, verse 8. The little horn of Daniel 7 came out of the fourth empire and in its final stage, which, properly interpreted, still, refer, still refers to the future. Now, for him, that future was because he was a dispensationalist, and the future was the future Antichrist. Um, he says, however, Wolver may see Antiochus as the primary fulfillment of chapter 8. He does say this. This may typically picture the time of the end. So he sees Antiochus in chapter 8, but he sees him as a symbol for the last day Antichrist. He believes that this minor Seleucid king meets the requirements of the biblical text by one, setting himself up as God, thus disregarding the starry host from verse 10. He sets himself up as prince of the host, making himself great, verse 11. He stopped the daily, or in this case, as they interpreted, daily sacrifices offered in the temple, verse 13. He threw truth to the ground, verse 12. And history has recorded that he took the name Epiphany, which means glorious one, assuming that he was God. And, and he ends with this statement. He, Antiochus IV, his role is similar to the future role of the coming world dictator, the coming end time Antichrist. So, that's set up from why uh, most dis dispensationalists view or still view Antiochus in this, in this section. And critters do too. But we're historicists. Now, Daniel gives us some identifying marks of the little horn, Daniel 7. They are, it rose out of the fourth beast, verses 8 to 24. It appeared after ten other horns, verse 24, so those are the incoming uh, uh, barbarian kingdoms. Uh, it was a little, it was little when it first was seen, but in time it became greater than its fellows, verses 8 and 20 of, of Daniel 7. It was uh, to put down three kings, so that as it arose, three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots, verses 8 and 24. It had eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things, and it spoke words against the Most High, verses 8 and 25. It was to wear out the saints of the Most High, verse 25. And it was to think to change the times and the law, verse 25. Notice in verse 25 we have this whole thing, speaking great things against God, wear out the saints, and to think to change times and laws. In fact, this is the first time we see it, point 8, it was allotted special powers for a time, two times, and half a time, verse 25. In chapter 8 of Daniel, we also examine the little horn and find that it too favors Rome over Antiochus. Chapter 8 parallels chapter 7 and the little horn that's there. Rome arose from the west out of one of the four winds. The Roman Church was a continuation of the Roman Empire, and as one can put it, the Roman Empire had become the Christian Church. The Roman Empire
empire, unlike Antiochus, successfully took control of the Middle East at the latter end, and of the dominion of the Hellenistic kingdoms, the Grecian kingdoms. Rome, unlike Antiochus, grew exceedingly great towards the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Pagan Rome emphatically and tragically magnified itself against the prince crucified, uh, I'm sorry, against the prince of the host. Uh, verse 11, and Pontius Pilate and the soldiers who condemned and crucified Christ were all Romans. Both began, uh, both pagan and Christian papal Rome destroyed mighty men of the people of the saints. Verse 24, and both pagan and Christian Rome took away the continual burnt offering and overthrew the place of the sanctuary. Verse 11. Now this is all out of Maxwell's book, uh, which would be the uh, God Cares Book 1. That would be on uh, page 161 uh, for those eight points. Uh, the first eight points I had listed is also out of Maxwell. So as you can see, Antiochus did not appear at the latter end. Verse 823. Nor did he prosper and grow exceedingly great. Verse 9. In relationship to the other powers mentioned, before it in chapter 8. In fact, the Roman ambassador, Pompilius Leonis, merely informed him, Antiochus, that the Roman Senate wanted him to leave. The Romans drew a circle around Antiochus with, with his cane and demanded a decision before he stepped out of it. The true fulfillment of the little horn is found in Rome, pagan and papal, not Antiochus IV. The Roman soldier that drew the circle around Antiochus was simply a diplomat representing Rome. He had no army behind him. And yet he's standing there with the leader of his army, Antiochus, with his army behind him, and demands him to turn back. This is when Antiochus was coming against the king of the south in, uh, in Egypt there in Ptolemy. Uh, he basically had an alliance, Rome had an alliance with the Ptolemaic uh, dynasty, and so he sent the representative to Antiochus, asked him the question, are you a friend of Rome? And drew the circle around him. Basically, like the line, line in the sand. You cross it, and it's to your doom. Um, he had no immediate, there was no immediate threat. Antiochus didn't have that. Uh, the diplomat had no army. But he knew that if he went ahead with it, he would incur the wrath of Rome. That he was not willing to do. So he backed up, went back up into uh, back home to Jerusalem. So this is the picture we see. Antiochus wasn't everything that the Bible has described this little horn power to be. He doesn't meet all the standards. The problem is, is that the Jews initially had seen Antiochus as the fulfillment. But as I said earlier in one other episode, this is the idea that we tend to do prophecy from the headlines. We read the prophecy. We look around the current events of what's happening in the world right now, and we pin those to the prophecy. And then some years later, we do it again. And so, because we find the prophecies not being fulfilled just that way. And in those days, uh, when, in the early years of these prophecies, they saw three kingdoms, not four. But then Rome came. Now we had four. And so we see later on in the late first century, Josephus, explaining the same prophecy of Daniel 2 and whatnot, not, doesn't list the three kingdoms, he lists four. And so, as hindsight's twenty twenty, they begin to see the bigger picture. And so, just because the Jews may have interpreted this as Antiochus in the beginning, doesn't make it so. Any more than we have, in our past, made decisions and interpretations of prophecies, and then later on time the road, uh, down the road, had to change our minds about some things, uh, about what they might mean. Uh, we see this here all through the late 19th and into the middle, right into the middle of the 20th century, dealing with the Eastern question and the sick man of the East, the Ottoman Turks. Today, we see some people still reviving that Eastern question and saying that there will be a rise of the a sick man of the East. The Ottoman Turk Empire will rise again and still yet fulfill the prophecy, as Uriah Smith had in his book, Daniel Revelation, which he simply got from other interpreters and from other historicists of the day, such as Alexander Keith and Edward Gibbons and others. And so we have to keep this in mind, 
that we can't do prophecy from the headlines. We have to let Scripture explain itself. And that's where we kind of find ourselves right here. The other thing that I wanted to look at was uh, the, the area there back in verse 8. And the male goat made himself exceedingly great. That's great. But once he became powerful, the large horn, horn was broken. That's Alexander. And in his place, four prominent horns came up toward the four winds of heaven. And that's the, uh, his, his division. Lysander, Cassandra, uh, Ptolemy, and uh, Antiochus. And so these four prominent horns came up towards the four winds of heaven, is how this is uh, translated. Um, the large horn was broken, therefore, uh, therefore the goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. The horn of Alexander was quickly broken when he died suddenly, leaving the empire to his generals, who within a few years carved it into four divisions. It was not as strong as it was in its early days. Some land was lost. Not all the geography uh, was able to be maintained by the former generals. Notice that he waxed very great and that he magnified himself exceedingly. The horn was broken after the ram was defeated in what appears to be a time of relative peace. The words four winds and heaven are respectively masculine, feminine, masculine. And this begs the question, from which did the, four horn, the little horns come forth? From one of the winds or from one of the four horns? Uh, recently a suggestion has been made that explains completely the sequence of feminine, masculine genders in the opening phrase. Now this is a, from some work done by Gerhard Hazel. It's in a paper titled, The Little Horn, The Saints in the Sanctuary in Daniel 8. And you find that in the book edited by Arnold V. Wallenkamp, Parts 1 and 2, and Richard, uh, uh, W. Richard Lesher, Parts 3 and 4. Uh, the Sanctuary and the Atonement is the name of the book. Washington, uh, D.C., Review and Herald, 1981, page 183. This is the work of Gerhard Hazel, which says, so that the masculine to the four winds feminine, he says, of the heavens masculine, Daniel 8, 9, and from one of them, and the phrase, and from what the one is feminine, from them is masculine. So he's connecting the feminine and the masculine, and the one of them is the heavens, not one of the four horns. Now, there's been some interesting things done later on this, I'm not a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar. There's been a series of uh, seminars in Bering Springs on uh, Daniel 11. I'm presenting various views. To the very far right, conservative, or ultra conservative, to maybe some more liberal views. But either way, during this discussion, this, there was some talk about this first. And uh, I'm trying to, I think it was Yonker who had brought up. Uh, that this isn't really holding as much mustard. But the idea isn't wrong, because they show in other places where it does hold up, but it's a little bit different than what we have imagined. I'm sorry I don't have that at my fingertip here with you. I'll have to go back and get all that back together again. And uh, But that should maybe encourage you to explore more into this. Uh, but this seemed to be the answer in the day. You'll see the same thing here presented in the uh, seven volumes of uh, uh, the BRI's uh, books on the uh, sanctuary, um, especially books six and seven on the book of Revelation. Um, I'm sorry, it'd be the book on Daniel, actually, that they uh, would have, his, and I think they have his paper in there. They think, I think Frank Hazel's paper is in there. Again, I, I don't remember. I have to check that out. Uh, maybe I get that for you next time that we're here. So the idea is, is this is a parallel of Daniel 7. And when it parallels Daniel 7, we see the same things coming along, the same animals representing, and these animals representing these, these parallel nations down to the little horn power. Notice in Daniel 8, Daniel kind of jumps right over from Greece to the little horn. He jumps right over Rome in its divisions and what's going on there. And it's focused on that little horn power, on that power who will deceive God's people. And uh, that's 
that's the focus that we have here. And that's the one who holds God's people in contempt, who holds them in uh, captivity, if you will. And that's why in verse 14 is the center of this vision, uh, this chapter 7, 8, and 9, which gives us the solution to till when, on the 2300th evening morning, the sanctuary will be set free, vindicated, cleansed. And it's not so much to do with the, uh, the, the cultic ritual of cleansing the, uh, the earthly sanctuary of sin, that can be part of it, but it has to do with setting God's people free. And I showed you there out of uh, Revelation 13 that the word tabernacle was used in reference to God's people when the beast went to make war with the Lamb and those who dwell in heaven, that is the tabernacle of God. Or as he says, the tabernacle, that is those who dwell in heaven, which is a reference to God's people. And so in this case, it really has to do with... Uh, God setting things right, putting the focus back on to him and off of Satan. Part of God's plan of moving the kingdom of darkness back into the kingdom of light. Part of God's plan of restoring justice in an unjust world. And it has to do with vindicating the saints. That's why back in chapter 7, verse 22, we get that verse where the little horn is judged and his body is handed over for the burning. We see in verse 22, judgment was found in favor of the saints. The saints have been being persecuted, the true saints. And it's not that the judgment was set up to judge them, but by judging the little horn and exposing it for who it was, it shows God's true saints for who they are. And hence, judgment's found in their favor. And that's what we see happening here. And then we need the time factor, because this has to do with consummation, the end time, as I said before. And this is where chapter 9 begins to come in and set the key. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, uh, next time, and uh, maybe before that I'll go and get some of this other stuff we talked about. Maybe I can get it together and give you a little clearer picture for your own research. Um, like, I, like I said earlier, this isn't so much uh, for me to be the big answer man for you, but to help lead you into some of the study I've been doing and, and uh, encourage you to do your own study and see that there's a bigger picture and questions are, uh, that should be asked maybe in, in some of the answers are some of the assumed answers that might help you in your own personal study. This isn't uh, a doctrine, as many have viewed it in the past, of God discovering who is safe and who is not safe to be saved. And God already knows his people. Uh, salvation is not something God has to do a judgment on to discover who qualifies and who doesn't. He knows right now. But he does do things for the universe to see, so they can see that God is just. He does do these things for the universe to see and expose the real uh, problem of those who are trying to usurp his power, such as Satan, who comes in and takes upon himself the prerogatives of God. And we see that in him, and we see that in his earthly uh, mentor, his mentee, uh, who is the little horn, who tries to uh, take upon himself God's power as if he is God himself. So that's where we find ourselves today, and uh, we're going to go uh, finish up some of this stuff here the next time, and maybe begin to segue into chapter 9, as we prepare to lay out the story of uh, how this fits in with the end time, uh, where we are in salvation history, and why this is important for us to understand. This isn't just some theological thing in the corner, but it kind of helps let the church know where we are, and if we know where we are, we know what the message is for this time. And we're not running ahead or behind in delivering that message. So let's stay with me through, through the journey. I hope you've enjoyed today a little bit. Maybe got you thinking, asking some questions. And uh, if so, that's good.